I'm Thomas, and I'd like to tell you about Wupstream. There's some interesting algorithms engineering going on here. It was our submission to the ACM 6 Spatial GISCOP 2008. Let's go. As we all know, one of the most important things about any project is the code name. And since we calculate upstream features, our first idea was to call it Uberstream. But then we realized that, in fact, Lyft is a sponsor of ACM 6 Spatial. So how about Liftstream? Now that we're talking about sponsors, actually, ESRI seems like a bigger deal, but by now, this pun doesn't work at all. So let's just call it VIPstream, since we're from Würzburg. So let's talk about upstream features. We are given a graph, and whenever I say feature, that's either a node or an edge. We have a set of start features and a set of controller features. And something is called an upstream feature if it's on a simple path from some start feature to some controller feature. So in this example, that would be these nodes and edges. If I have another controller, I also get these features. Now I want you to notice this blob in the middle here. We're talking about simple paths, and I can get from the start feature into this blob and kind of do whatever I want and then go out and go to the controller. By analyzing the graph more precisely, we can indeed formalize this concept of a block and can talk about entire blocks as being upstream or not. So this triangle on the left is also a block, and if we have this other controller, then we also get all of it. This is another block. And in order to make the theory work out, these single edges are also considered blocks. In terms of upstream features, we can now kind of forget about the actual graph. Depending on whether we get this controller or not, we get everything that's in these three blocks. I've kind of sketched the connectivity of these blocks by overlap, but let's actually pull them apart and be more specific about how they are connected. And then we hook them back up with these nodes that represent the point of overlap of different blocks. This thing is actually known in the literature and it's called a block cut tree. The important observation here is that this thing is actually a tree. So let's solve upstream features in trees. Let's do a traversal from a controller and mark the backwards direction. So for those edges, we know if we go in that direction, we'll eventually get to a controller. So that's the orange arrows. Let's also do it from the other controller now with green arrows so we can see the difference. And here the thing that we notice is that as soon as we try to go across an edge that's already marked in this backwards direction, the current traversal can stop. It does not need to go there because we already know that coming back this direction will end up at a controller somewhere. And upstream features don't care about what feature it is. So this can stop here. We also don't need to go into here and so forth. Now we do the same thing basically from the start features. We call this flood from start. We follow the marked direction of edges because we know that if we go there, eventually we will end up at a controller. So everything that we see now is definitely an upstream feature because it is on a simple path from the start feature that we're flooding from. And we know that we're definitely on the way to a controller somewhere. So that goes up to the left here, but it doesn't go down to the bottom right because that edge is not marked to go in there. Then we go up, but not to the right. And now we have found all of the blocks that are upstream features. And going back to our original graph, any edges and vertices in these blocks are actual upstream features that we want to find. It's a little bit more subtle than that, but you should look at the paper for that. This is the basic idea. I also kind of hand waved what these blocks are exactly. And in modern terminology, they're actually called biconnected components, but they're quite old and they used to be called blocks. And at least Harari seems to think that they're kind of a big deal because in his book, Graph Theory, there is a chapter three, blocks, and trees are chapter four. So, okay. As he describes it, some connected graphs can be disconnected by the removal of a single point called a cut point. The distribution of such points is of considerable assistance in the recognition of the structure of a connected graph. Indeed, it gives us a straightforward way to find these upstream features as we just saw. But how do I get these blocks? How do I get this block cut tree? Luckily, Hopcroft and Charjan already figured this out in the early 70s, writing the following. It is with this in mind that we present a structure for representing graphs in a computer and several algorithms for simple operations on graphs. I find it quite interesting that this is so early that people are still thinking about how do I actually represent a graph in a computer? Of course, you can still think carefully about the details today, but this is groundbreaking stuff at the time. 
and they give an algorithm to find the blocks, or as they already call it, biconnected components. We don't really have time to go into it here, but this is a figure from their paper. It's a flowchart. Um, it actually gets to be quite complicated with all of these annotations. It's pretty fun that this is what an algorithm looked like in a paper. But like I said, we're not going to go into details there. And I just thought this was interesting to see as contrast, because this is another way that you can describe this algorithm. Like I said, Webstream is available on GitHub, and it contains an implementation of the Hopcroft and Tarjan algorithm. This is really all I wanted to say about the algorithm, theoretically speaking. Let's actually get into the implementation now. Webstream was C++ 11 at time of submission. We actually have some C++ 17 features right now, but don't worry about it. It's just some code, throw it at a compiler. And then, as dictated by the competition, we read the network with controller features from a JSON file, and we additionally get a list of start features. Webstream does its thing and outputs the upstream features. That was the competition. Let's look a little bit more specifically at the different steps that we go through. First, we read the file from disk into memory, and this is megabytes and megabytes of JSON, so this actually takes a measurable amount of time. Then we parse the JSON, and of these various individual steps, this is actually what takes the longest. Then we build our adjacency list, data structure for the graph, and run the Hopcroft Tarjan algorithm on it to get the block cut tree. And that's actually all of the things that take time. We have our mark controller step, we have our flood from start nodes step, but that takes measurably zero milliseconds. And then we need to write the output file, but in this instance, there aren't a lot of upstream features, so writing those out also doesn't really take that much time. The code is actually pretty clean and modern C++. We construct the block cut tree, and then we have these very nice for all loops. So that's all pretty simple, and this block cut tree, Hopcroft Tarjan algorithm is well, let's not go into it. There are a bunch of details there that we don't really have time for. To parse the JSON, we use a library called RapidJSON, and I really can recommend it. It's really fast, but still quite readable. So here's what that looks like for us. We make this RapidJSON document, then we give it our bytes to parse, and then we have this nice for loop over all of the row attributes, which is how the graph is described in the JSON format. Then we just have a function to add these edges, and that's it. Aside from the Hopcroft Tarjan algorithm itself and what's inside RapidJSON, all of this is very readable. This uh, Naperville instance that we see the timing for here is quite large, and we could say, well, about 50 milliseconds, that's fine, we're done here, but it's kind of unsatisfactory that we take about 50 milliseconds not doing any real work, and then if you count the block cut tree, it's 8 milliseconds, but if we assume that we can already have a block cut tree, then this is 0 milliseconds of work. And there is actually a serious amount of overhead in this data being JSON. It's a competition, we can't change the data format. But maybe if we're clever enough, we can cut some corners and still get everything right. So I asked some of my students to have a look at this. And they came up with a pretty cool way to read this data. And it's not actually all that complicated. Let's look at the code real quick. So it's basically a while loop over this character pointer. And we go through the characters, and then if we see a quote, then if the next character is a curly open, and we're in state zero, then the string ends 38 characters later, and then we skip 40 characters, and if the character after that is an A, then of course we have a controller, and, well, okay. Uh, <laughs> this is the result of looking really specifically at what kinds of identifiers were used in the competition namespace for the JSON. Please do not do this in production code. But in this way, we managed to get 31 milliseconds plus 15 milliseconds down into 18 milliseconds. This is a significant win. Then there's this block cut tree step, which I think we could probably implement to go a little bit quicker, but it didn't really make that much sense to go there when there was this much still to be won in the parsing. But I do want to point out that this is where the real work happens in Webstream. Like the mark controllers and the outputting takes less time than we can measure. So if you have a real network that you're going to do multiple queries on, you should definitely save this block cut tree and then your queries are basically free. 
And after that architectural note, I want to make a couple more really small, low-level comments about the programming in WebStream. And the first one is that actually memory management takes a measurable amount of time. So we looked at the format of the competition and the way it works is your program runs once and gives its output and then the program is over, it's done. If the process terminates, the operating system gives back all the memory that you've used. So there is really no point in being careful about your memory. So what we decided to do was leak all the memory, throw away your normal memory allocator, just allocate a big block at the start of the program and just write all over the place. Nobody cares. This actually saved us a couple of milliseconds. But here I want to add, do as we say, not as we do. And I say the following, you should use object pools. Boost has this, it's pretty cool, check it out. It can be much faster than normal heap allocation. The version we've released on GitHub does this. Another optimization we've made in terms of memory management is based on the following observation. In these actual real world networks, there are a lot of low degree nodes. The vast majority of nodes has degree at most four. There are some clever things you can do under the hood to make small vectors faster and still support big vectors, and WebStream does that. This work was mostly driven by Boston Hyos small vector, which unfortunately is not open source, so you'll have to make do with the slightly worse boost small vector. And that's really all I wanted to say about the details here. The broader point is that algorithms plus implementation equals more better. It's not just about having the cleverest algorithm. It's not just about being extremely precise and detail oriented in the programming. It's the combination of these two things that actually give you fast code. You should do what is known as algorithms engineering. So that's it. If there are any questions, uh, leave a comment, let me know. And if you want to have a look, check it out on GitHub.